Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. There are few stories quite as gripping as historical stories. The drama of how we got here is a gripping storyline, a betrayal of historical realities, though, or the only way we can understand history. With us today, four expert historical storytellers to talk about how you shape the past to make sense to the present. Dan Jones has written books about the Peasants' Revolt and the early Plantagenets, and he's now taken the story on with an account of the Wars of the Roses. The biographer and historian Lady Antonia Fraser has turned from the history of other men and women to her own in My History, a memoir of growing up. Composer and playwright Claire Van Campen ensures the historical authenticity of productions at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London. And the director Peter Kosminski is also with us. His television adaptation of Hilary Mantel's novels about the Tudor court of Henry VIII starts on BBC Two next week. We begin, though, with what Hollywood would probably call the prequel, the bloody and turbulent period that gave rise to the Tudors, explored in Dan Jones's new book. The Hollow Crown. Um, Dan Jones, you you begin in almost classic miniseries style right at the end with this grisly event, uh, the execution of Margaret Pole. Very, very late in the story you're telling. Why did you want to begin there? Well, I think one of the things I wanted to show when I was writing about the Wars of the Roses um, or, was that it didn't happen in isolation, if you see what I mean. There's, there wasn't a point in 1485 when everyone suddenly went, OK, the Wars of the Roses have finished now because the Battle of Bosworth has happened and now it's Tudor time. Uh, really, the issues um, that developed during the Wars of the Roses carried on, all, and they petered out, but they carried on deep into the Tudor period, beyond the reign of Henry VII, where we normally think, you know, um, uh, Battle of Stoke, uh, pretenders to the throne, but right into the reign of Henry VIII. And the episode... You're describing the execution of Margaret Pole in the Tower of London when she was 67 years old. People thought she was 80 or 90. Um, happened in the 1540s. And this isn't a time when we normally think the politics of the Wars of the Roses uh, have anything to do with the politics of the Tudor state. The episode draws together uh, the sort of uh, lingering remains of Plantagenet history with uh, the issues of the Reformation, because, of course, the Poles were... a, a uh, a leading Catholic family. So it's the sort of last bit of clearing up, the last bit of, of murderous clearing up to ensure that the reign continues without without the problems they've had in the past. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, I just wanted to get this sense that um, people were still thinking in terms of the Wars of the Roses. People were still trying to digest uh, the issues of the 15th century really deep in, in the 16th century. And, and towards the end of the book, I described the coronation procession of Elizabeth I. Now, when she came out of the Tower of London, processing towards Westminster, went through the city, as was uh, Tudor Convention, there were, there were pageants to sort of celebrate this great day. The first pageant she saw uh, displayed Henry VII and Elizabeth of York getting married, and it, and it was the white rose and the red, and it was this image of the Wars of the Roses, the peculiarly Tudor image of the Wars of the Roses, that was the the starting point of Tudor history, you know, in, in the second half of the 16th century. Um, I hadn't known until I read your book that the Wars of the Roses, that phrase, was essentially a Victorian invention. But it's built on this this Tudor myth-making, isn't it? That's really what your book is about, the, the creation of this well, that, idea. That's right. I mean, during the way I look at the Wars of the, the, wars of the 15th century um, were not as Wars of the Roses because, for one reason, um, whilst the House of York... Uh, was represented by a white rose. The House of Lancaster really wasn't, and this was this was a, a sort of late projection backwards by the Tudors onto the House of Lancaster, mainly, as far as I can see, to create the Tudor rose. So t to come up with a very simple analogy or a very simple image for what had just happened, these chaotic, bloody, complicated, shifting wars of the 15th century, could be explained in purely dynastic terms, reds versus whites, it was like a football match, not a Tudor football match, I hasten to add, a modern football match, uh, in which they all came together at the end. And uh, the most... And then that's why it stayed. In, in, yeah, in, and if that was... That's how we think of it now. If that was the symbolic solution, then they had to yes. reverse engineer it to, to insist that that had been the problem in the first place. But in your view, it wasn't. It was a, it was a different kind of it, thing that was happening. It was very, very different. Uh, but the, I think the reason why it's, uh, it's lasted, this image of, of the Wars of the Roses, as such a kind of a binary, um, reds versus white. It, a lot of it is to do with Shakespeare, because Shakespeare's sort of genius, his dramatic genius, um, applied to the politics of the 15th century in the 1590s, 
uh, was so great and so influential and has been so powerful over the centuries, that's still how we think of the Wars of the Roses today. We can't get past this lens of Shakespeare when we're looking back into the 15th century. But as I try and explain in the book, the, the reality was, was a lot messier than that. Uh, it's me- it's both messier and um, uh, and less uh, reprehensible in many ways, isn't it? I mean, you're quite generous to many of the principals who other historians haven't been generous to, saying that we're just trying to make the best of a bad job. They had Henry VI, a very weak king who'd followed a very strong king, a paragon of kingship, and they somehow had to make that work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things you, I think you've got to remember when you're writing history, um, and I think this is something that H- Hilary... Mantel might have told Peter is that these people don't know they're in history so when you're analysing decision making in history you have to remember that nobody knows the outcome and that people are acting with limited knowledge, uh, often under enormous pressure, if we look at the case of let's say, uh, the most notorious case Richard III, the princes in the tower why did Richard, Duke of Gloucester make this decision to usurp the throne from his nephew Um, you, you can't explain the, that, that decision-making in 1483 with reference to anything that happened afterwards. And you've got to try and understand the limited amount of knowledge and the enormous political pressure that people were acting under as they made decisions. Um, and often, in the case of Richard, as I, as I argue in, in the book, anything he decided to do, I think, would have been the wrong decision or would have had bad consequences. So it's, in a sense, the sort of essence of a tragedy. And um, part of the storyline here is the rise of the Tudors, and you say at the beginning of the book, it's a question needs answering. How on earth did they come to the centre of power when at the first they were on the very periphery? Um, I mean, what's your answer to that? There's this fascinating moment when Margaret of Anjou favours Edmund and Jasper Tudor. She doesn't have to. She doesn't have to kind of confer upon them a, a, a semi-legitimacy. Why does she do that? What does she gain out of that? Well, in that particular moment, um, Edmund and Jasper Tudor were the half-brothers of Henry VI, and Henry VI didn't have much family to go around. You know, you'd gone from a case uh, a generation or two previously where Henry V had had three brothers, where there was, even within the the early Lancastrian royal family that that had replaced Richard II in 1399, there were a lot of royal princes and, and a lot of people in the direct royal family. But that's not the case by the time you get to Henry VI's reign. There really aren't very many people to go around. And Henry VI hasn't uh, proven to be a sort of virile, um, a manly king who's fathered a huge brood of children. In fact, he, he hasn't he went, any. In, he went into a coma at one point, didn't he, for a long, long period of time? Well, what, Or not coma, but... A... Well, the, the, central myst- the central mystery, or the central, uh, for me, the central um, problem of the Wars of the Roses is the madness of Henry VI. So in the 1450s, Henry VI went into some sort of, uh, this isn't a medical diagnosis, but catatonic schizophrenia, you know, a total shutdown where he couldn't feed himself, he could barely raise his head, he didn't recognise his wife. Uh, when, his, his, when his son was born, he had absolutely no, he couldn't recognise that either. And, and that total physical collapse... Um, led to a total political collapse and a vacuum. There'd been a, pretty much a vacuum at the centre of politics anyway because Henry VI was such an incompetent king. Uh, but the, the, So the madness of Henry VI really is, is at the heart of the Wars of the Roses. It does. Um, Peter Kosminski it gives a completely different perspective to, to the, the central crux of Wolf Hall and, and Henry's desperate desire to have an heir when you think that preceding him as decades and decades where that is the chief aim of statecraft to secure the succession, to ensure that you don't have wars and battles and civil strife. And particularly when your own claim to the throne is pretty tenuous, as as Dan has been explaining. Um, As I understand it, uh, Henry V's wife remarried somebody who seemed to be distinctly below her in social terms, and the the children of that marriage ended up being the, the roots of the Tudors. Um, Antonio Fraser, does a, a historian must inevitably become cynical about notions of legitimacy, um, mustn't they? Well, cynical is an interesting word. I was just picking up on what uh, Dan said. Um, there's a, a, a saying of the great historian Maitland, F.W. Maitland, we must always remember uh, that what, what now lies in the past once lay in the future. And I think that is, has always been the sort of central point of my own investigations into history and I think it's so true and that's why I enjoyed the hollow crown so much 
that you were absolutely determined that we shouldn't start being anachronistic, you know, that we shouldn't start saying, well, of course, he knows he's going to... He, he, he woke up in his pram and said, hooray, I'm going to marry <laughs> six times, you know. Of course he didn't. And I think that is what's so sort of exciting to try and find out what actually happened, to remember that. But I also just want to pick up about the Plantagenet blood. Aren't I right that when Elizabeth clearly... Elizabeth I clearly is not going to produce an heir in the 1590s, and the next heir, by most laws, are the Stuarts over the border in Scotland, with the main Stuart, a Catholic, Mary, Queen of Scots, perfectly, you know, Tudor, grandmother. Um, didn't they start investigating English claims? Wasn't a Hastings and a Derby? All, all these claims came from the Plantagenets, didn't they? They did, and there had been, there, there were traces of Plantagenet yes. uh, blood left around. It's interesting. Um, I've just been reading in draft a brilliant new book about Henry VIII's will by um, Tudor historian Susanna Lipscomb, and what what's fascinating about that point in the middle of the 16th mm. century, and what makes his will very different to uh, to other kings' wills, is when Henry died, he tried to sort this out in advance. Mm. He tried to lay out a, an enormous roadmap for the succession in the case of. Uh, you know, it, various lines going extinct. But uh, going back to the point of legitimacy, I, I see royal legitimacy as always something that's discussed in retrospect. There's a pragmatic grab for power, and then everyone sort of starts uh, working out how to justify it and drawing up family trees. But to, that's not quite true, favor. because both Mary Tudor and Elizabeth, two reigning queens regnant, they were both illegitimate according to their father and neither um, illegitimacy was rescinded by him but he did say that they could succeed. That's rather fascinating isn't it? You know, if there isn't a decent male, well then an illegitimate girl. He's the one who said they're illegitimate I mean, mm. uh, by no standards could Mary Tudor have been illegitimate actually. It was absolutely Absolute. looking back and this suits me um, uh, It can happen the other way round though, can't it? Because there were no questions whatsoever about the legitimacy of of Henry the Sixth succession, it was clear and, and uncontested. No? Well, not not at the time, but of course, then what what happens is in uh, in the fourteen sixties or in fourteen sixties specifically, when Richard Duke of York is backed into a terrible corner by the, the Act of Attainder passed against him by Margaret of Anjou, is they start redrawing family trees to show the Lancastrian line had absolutely no right to to rule after thirteen ninety nine. Now. During Henry V's time, absolutely no one was saying this because they thought everything was sort of marvellous. Um, Claire Van Kemp. Well, uh, listening to this is fascinating, isn't it? Because um, we know that Shakespeare spent so much of his time at the Globe consolidating this reign of Elizabeth. And it tells you, listening to this, doesn't it, that um, the power of the public in that very public space, the Globe, was desperately important to the politicians of the time and, and you know, to... We we think of that period as, oh, Elizabeth was on the throne so long. It was all very confirmed. I don't think it was. I think that she was under tremendous threat a lot of the time. The public had to be persuaded that England was on solid ground this time. That's the point of the street theatre, isn't it? Those pageants of procession which, which create the idea of legitimacy are a piece of theatre. Mm. Well, they, re they require an artistic... I wonder, Claire, what, what you think. How do you... I'm not a Shakespearean expert and uh, so I wonder what you think how political was Shakespeare because I sometimes see him as the sort of um, uh, James Cameron or you know or, uh, or, or George Lucas of the day creating entertainment that's probably a bad example Ridley Scott might be a better one creating entertainment out of history with primarily a dramatic and entertaining purpose or do you see him as in some way a um, an agent of kind of Tudor propaganda that's what the Richard III society would sit here and, and say to us now Shakespeare was a sort of Tudor stooge trying to write Richard III as the greatest demon in all of history, and I, I never quite buy that with Shakespeare, but I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't you. say he was an agent of Tudor propaganda, but um, there was certainly something about um, putting on stories for the people at the Globe that were going to influence them one way or another. I mean, it's very interesting if you look at the texts that, that he does use, the source stories particularly, when we have Julius Caesar, a play about tyranny, the Scottish play, a play about tyranny, um, and then we have, of course, the history plays, 
obviously painting the Plantagenets in a rather bad light and bolstering up Henry V, uh, you know, and the Tudor reign. It, it, why would he need to do that? Why would he need to spend so much time on that? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to... I, I, I want to turn to Peter Kosminski, um, uh, who won't be accused Can of I being... Can yeah, yeah, very quickly. Let's not forget, and Claire, you know this very well, he was also a steward... Um, playwright James the First. I mean, the Scottish play, as you call it, um, was written to show that James the Stuart, James the Sixth and First, um, was descended from a line of kings, wasn't it? That's true. I mean, there may have been an earlier draft of that play, which, um, because of James's piece uh, Maleficus Maleficarum against yeah. witchcraft, may have changed the text of that play somewhat to reflect the Stuart line in a better light. And maybe that's just a, a theatre manager holding on to his job. Well, I don't uh, know. And that's almost everybody involved trying to hold on to their heads, which is the, <laughs> is the context in which we come to Wolf Hall, where a sort of prevailing sense of dread, I think, is the most powerful uh, mood you get out of those, um, those dramas. Peter Kosminski, um, you made your reputation with difficult drama documentary. I mean, it's a difficult genre in itself because it's contested, but then you, within that you took on very, very difficult subjects. Um, do you see this as a detour or is it just a drama documentary of a different kind? I just see it as a huge pleasure. Um, it's like somebody gave me the most enormous prize or present. Um, but, of course, there are similarities and I can see why I was asked to do it. Um, you know, it is an intensely political period, and Hilary Mantel is an intensely political writer. I mean, you can o- only have to watch the furore, particularly in the pages of the Daily Mail and, and certain quarters of the House of Lords, when she wrote a, a little story called the Im- Imagining the Assassination of Margaret Thatcher. Hilary is an intensely political person. I admire her for it. Uh, she's not afraid to state her opinions. And she's brought that... Um, political acuity into her writing of the, of the period we've been discussing. So perhaps it's, it isn't a completely bonkers idea to bring someone who's done some political drama in to direct it. Were, you, um, were there vices of costume drama that you were determined to avoid? Was it, a, was it a genre that you were wary of in any way as a director? I have to be honest and say that it was a genre with which I was not particularly familiar. It's not the kind of thing I would tend to watch. So although there was a great deal of sort of gnashing of teeth in the production office and amongst the executive producers, it will not be like this show or it will not be like that show. I hadn't actually seen any of them. What were the names that came up, just out of curiosity? I really don't think I should say (laughs) that, out of fairness to my fellow (laughs) programme makers. But the... uh, Actually, it wasn't really a question of sort of a flight from one particular show or one particular genre. I brought the same uh, sort of approach to to uh, directing Peter Strong's extraordinary scripts of, of Wolf Hall, and they, they, they were extraordinary. Um, to, to, as I used for normal political and temporary dialogue, I just try to make these people real. I try to shoot it in such a way that it doesn't seem as if it's all happening on a pross arch, but that we're, we're following Thomas Cromwell around. We're seeing things as he sees them, coming back on him to see how he is reacting. Often he has to be quite stony-faced to conceal what he's feeling inside. One of the things I adored about Wolf Hall was it was was a blatant piece of revisionist history. You know, I I wasn't a historian at at, at school or university, anything like it, but even I had picked up the lionisation of Thomas More. Well, he certainly isn't lionised in Hilary Mantel's interpretation. Uh, She makes great emphasis of the fact that he tended to torture people in his gatehouse. So here we have a piece of quite radical revisionist history, taking somebody who's seen essentially as as a baddie in in the most sort of examined period of British history, really, as as you guys have been discussing, and putting him centre stage, making him a, a modern hero, conflicted, certainly with feet of clay, certainly making mistakes, experiencing tragedy early in life. Did you have any anxieties about the uh, about psychological anachronism? Because one of the things I thought, uh, I think Mark Rylance's performance is extraordinary, Where, wary, careful, uh, sort of wounded, even though he's a very powerful man. And it, it reveals to you why Hilary Mantel starts with him being beaten, because he is... And, I, you know, you sit and watch it and you think, oh, he's an abused child. And, you know, he's acting as an abused child. But that is a very modern notion. Uh, are we wrong to back project it into the past, or do you think it's le- to some degree legitimate, legitimate in a different way? Well, I'm going to speak with 
from a position of utter ignorance because I'm not a historian, I'm just a film director. But my view, for what it's worth, is that we're all human beings and it's actually not that long ago. You know, it's six, seven, eight lives of man or woman. And if you're Thomas Cromwell and you rise from being the son of a blacksmith who left home when he was seven, eight or nine years old to make his way in the world alone, and you rise to be the second most powerful person in the land, working for a king who really couldn't be that bothered with the business of state, therefore in many ways the most powerful person in the land. And yet every so often the king does something or says something that shows that unless you deliver your fate will be very similar to the fate of his decapitated wives. It must concentrate the mind ama amazingly. <laughs> um, Antonio Fraser, what do you th feel well, about when, this subject of, of sort of back projection of psychology? Well, I think um, I try to be objective, but nobody is totally objective. I mean, I think all historians try very hard. But, I mean, if you think of another Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell, when I was working on a biography of Oliver Cromwell and I read the um, biographies of him written in the 30s, they are clearly heavily influenced by the existence of Mussolini and Hitler, although these were reputable historians who didn't know they were being influenced. So we're all influenced by something. And I think you're absolutely right. I, I think, as a historian, one should have written on one's mirror on the one hand, this person is exactly like me, um, full of vanity, jealousy, love, um, crossness, arrogance, modesty, and all the rest of it. <laughs> Longing for high ideals, probably getting a bit lower, what they actually do. All of that, exactly the same. On the other hand, this person, I'm thinking of Mary, Queen of Scots, became Queen of Scotland when she was six days old. That is something I cannot possibly um, do anything but imagine. You know, I have, I have no experience of being Queen at any age, let alone six days old. So between the two, that's the excitement of writing real history, and I quite see it's also the excitement of your work. Dan Jones. What I, I wanted to ask you, Peter, um, Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies have been phenomenal literary successes um, dealing with historical subjects. They are the most successful historical fiction of our time, of the present time. Um, I won, what, But what strikes me is that this is now becoming the historical approach as well, the, the Mantell approach to Thomas Cromwell, which is let's not forget, essentially a literary and dramatic approach. We are humanising Thomas Cromwell and in some senses back-projecting our own current psychological sort of obsessions. Um, is, is already filtering into the history of the period. It's remarkable. The, late, so the latest biography of Thomas Cromwell, beautiful, elegantly written book by Tracy Borman, uh, takes as its starting point a debt owed to Hilary Mantel uh, and adopts as its historical uh, drive the attempt to balance Cromwell's supposed um, you know, uh, monstrous qualities with the fact that he was sort of nice to a couple of people once or twice. And I, I do find that in some senses slightly concerning because we're, we're, we're blurring the boundaries now between liter literature and history. Um, does it matter if the novelist uses the same methods? Uh, as a historian, I mean, all, well, all can, his I, can I just come in? Uh, I mean, it, and it's on that point, Tom. Um, let's not forget that Hilary Mantel spent five years researching this subject before she wrote it. And because I come from a documentary background, I was, I was frankly quite terrified of taking on this project. So I surrounded myself with the comfort factor of various speaking to various historians and hiring a researcher and and um, sending heads of department into the V&A for weeks on end. And what was interesting, talking to what, what one might call recognised academic historians of the period, was how they all admired and respected the research that Hillary had done. Now, having worked in factual programmes for 35 years, that's quite unusual in my experience. Uh, Antonio Fraser. I want to refer back in 60, in history, uh, to the 1960s, to the extraordinary success of another great historical um, episode, great historical play, A Man for All Seasons by Robert Bolt. Now that absolutely swept the country in exactly the same way and then it was made, in my opinion, in a wonderful historical film. Do you ever see it? I, I mean, did with Paul Schofield. Exactly. Yeah. Paul Schofield. Very, very different view of Sir Thomas More. The, but I mean, that's my <laughs> point. You see, and everybody knew then exactly what Thomas More was like because of this marvellous play. It was frightfully good. Paul Schofield was fantastic. Well, we loved it because of Paul um, Schofield, I think. Everyone well, was no, in love with I, it. I I think a lot of people who love history loved it because it gave 
a sort of vigorous idea, very attractive, young Henry VIII, mm. a golden boy, Robert Shaw, just as Damien Lewis is obviously another golden. But the point I'm trying to make is that in the 60s, we knew what Thomas More was like, and he was wonderful. Now we know what Thomas <laughs> Grobble was like. What interests me is what is the reality, and that's the fascinating test. Um, you know? And Antonio, this leads directly on to your book, um, uh, My History, which is both a memoir of your early life, but also an account of your beginning to write history. Yeah. And you have a very romantic approach to history. I mean, it is one possessed by uh, glamour, by charisma by a sense of the romance of, of life histories, isn't it? I mean, Mary, Queen of Scots, entered your imagination very, very early and wouldn't go away. And, and to... so did Queen Matilda, though, alas, I've never written about her. Is there a good book about Queen Matilda, Dan? Have you written about Queen Matilda? The, the best thing recently written about Matilda is by Helen Castor in her book about she-wolves, which course, has a wonderful yes. sort of quarter of the book. Anyway, yeah. No, but I, I, of course, I, I mean, a child is grabbed by the romance of something. I... I if you don't mind me saying so, I think um, I don't try to convey the sheer glamour of Oliver Cromwell, but um, you may find me <laughs> overcome by the glamour of Oliver Cromwell. I but like of, the idea. One of the very interesting things you say in your book is that when you were writing about Oliver Cromwell, you drew on memories of how your own grandfather made speeches. And it's a very interesting emblem, that, isn't it, of the, the historian's dilemma, that you're working from what you know back towards something that you don't know. I received, uh, received a wonderful put-down on that subject. When I announced I was writing about Oliver Cromwell, uh, immediately after Mary, Queen of Scots, because I'm someone who likes the challenge, you know, and I didn't want to do after Mary, Queen of Scots, Marie Antoinette, who wants to write about Marie Antoinette? Never mind, I went and did so. <laughs> and I was doing Cromwell, and a lot of people said that Enoch Powell, who was absolutely in his prime, if I can put it like that at the time, uh, was like Oliver Cromwell. I then met by chance Enoch Powell and said, and he said, what are you writing? The obvious question. I said, I'm writing about Oliver Cromwell and then said, sort of daringly, and a lot of people say he's like you, Mr Powell. And he looked at me with absolute contempt and said, not at all, I'm a monarchist, and turned away. And that was the end of me. <laughs> I think he was secretly pleased. Mm -hmm. I bet he was secretly pleased. Do you think he was? Yeah, I think he was. Well, yes. that's very <laughs> exciting. I shall go and write that in my diary. <laughs> how much? Um, how much latitude? You have this. You have a character. You do the immense amounts of research. Do you allow yourself any latitude in speculation at all when you're writing, say, Mary, about no, Mary I'm, Queen I'm, of Scots? I, I keep the rules, and I'm very strict because otherwise it wouldn't be interesting. If there's a really good story um, that I just cannot bear to leave out, I do have one phrase, which is. In print, is it fanciful to speculate that? And I always use that. The answer nearly always is, yes, it is fanciful to speculate that. But I don't cheat. You know, if I'm caught out, if I'm wrong, then that's my fault. But I didn't mean to be wrong. And um, do you ever envy the liberties of the novelist in writing history? I think I have the uh, enjoyment of the novelist in writing history. But, uh, um, in in what way though? Because that's interesting. Because you've just said you you know you're absolutely rigorous about what's what's a, what's let in and what's not. So where where does the the liberty of the novelist come in in writing history for you? I don't think the liberty of the novelist does come in. Oh, sorry, I, th I, I understood the enjoyment. that you. Oh, the enjoyment, right? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, you know, novelists, I'm sure, have great enjoyment. Is that it's, a matter of structuring the t the story? Yes, I mean, structure to me is very important after I've done all the research. Some people research, write, research, write. I don't. I need the whole picture. After I've done all the research, which may take years, as with Marie Antoinette, then I probably allow three, four months just to sitting and looking at the structure and thinking, how can I convey, for instance, the importance of the Austrian childhood of Marie Antoinette? Uh, she was 14 when she came to France, but she wasn't a baby. That's often left out. The importance of the captivity of Mary, Queen of Scots, which even reputable historians cut short, but it was nearly half her life. You know, these are the problems which I imagine are like the problems of a novelist or mm. a playwright, Claire. Mm. Well, fanciful speculation, that's a very interesting term, isn't it? Because how accurate can you get? How accurate should you get? And uh, certainly Shakespeare... Um, had a very wide view of that, didn't he, with a character like Richard III, who he brought up the Richard III Society. But there's a lot of truth that his Shakespeare's version uh, was set in a very different way for perhaps a very different reason, and it was very fanciful speculation. Although, Although, Dan Jones. 
Although then if we look at the play Richard II, it's much, much closer to history much because closer. history, in this case, happened to have a fairly neat, dramatic shape. Mm. I wanna, Peter, one of the things I, I... And I, by the way, I thoroughly enjoyed the first episode of Wolf, Wolf Hall, which Thank I've seen, and, and Mark's performance which was, was astonishing. Um, uh, w- one of the things I enjoyed about Wolf Hall is that there is a, a dramatic structure applied but as as you said the there's an immense amount of research and and there hasn't been that that uh, that liberty taken with certainly with events maybe with thoughts and feelings but uh, but this is still history simply presented in in uh, given dramatic form well, all drama that reflects on true events whether they happened 5 minutes ago 5 years ago or 500 years ago as in the case of wolf hall really have to have some kind of set of rules by which to work and and uh, in my other work certainly um as a writer and director of these kinds of dramas i've i've always stuck to a fairly straightforward perhaps overly simplified rule which is is it misleading now that you think well that surely needs to be a bit more complicated than that but if you f- if you dig down into it you can. It doesn't really matter whether the, in a film whether the wallpaper was the right colour or whether they were drinking coffee or tea. The question is, have you turned a scene that, that actually was a polite discussion into a row for dramatic effect? That's misleading. Um, you, it's interesting you raise wallpaper and, and so on. But, um, Claire Van Campen, uh, you, you're working um, at The Globe, uh, which has very, very strict rules for authenticity well, and clearly believe that it does matter. It, you know, it matters what underwear you're wearing when you're on stage. Well, if, if we're doing what we call an original practices production... Uh, Just and, explain original yes, practices it's, for people it's who very, don't know about it. very good that you've asked me to do that because um, a lot of people have asked that over the years and it's it's hard to explain except that one would say we use sources and references. We don't make anything up uh, in that uh, we use music that we know... Shakespeare could have used, would have possibly heard, on instruments that were there at the time. The clothes are usually handmade and are exact copies of clothes that you find in, you know, Victor and Albert Museum and, and, and places like that. So to our best guesses, we're putting something on a stage um, that Shakespeare could have recognised, and that's the basis of original practices. Uh, and that's the judgment, though, is it? That, that you've got a, some, some imagination of Shakespeare coming into the room and sort of saying, oh, yeah, that's, that's what it was like. You've always got to have Shakespeare's imagination <laughs> coming into the room. But I now think there's, a par- right. there's a paradox immediately, isn't mm. there? Um, you put on, in, say, in Twelfth Night, you put a song on stage. Uh, for a contemporary audience, it's not going to sound like a pop song. Mm. But it may well have been a pop song in... Yes. You're absolutely right. And this is the what we've built up at the Globe is a consensus of, a, of opinion. And this is what's been fascinating to me, watching an audience grow over the last 17 years or so, an audience that first of all came and sat down in the yard instead of standing. We had to encourage them that standing was good, you're going to enjoy it more this way. So over the years, we've grown an audience that have come to expect a certain culture at the Globe, um, which is exciting and gratifying. Uh, but of course, very different to how it was in Shakespeare's day when uh, clothes were, you know, the productions were in modern dress. They were Shakespearean modern dress to an audience dressed the same. So already you've got a difference. But sometimes I can believe that these songs can also become very popular in our time. We can suspend it. it, it Peter Kosminski, it's that you have the same problem, don't you? You film, filmed Wolf Hall in uh, real locations. And they are wonderfully evocative, but they're also old buildings. Uh, and in a way, they wouldn't have been old buildings. They would have been modern buildings. Absolutely. And, and, you know, for Pat Campbell, our designer, it's, it's an interesting dilemma. Uh, if you take tapestries, just as a simple example, we're all used to the idea of tapestries being beautifully faded. If we were to show the tapestries in the colours that they were at the time, everyone would think we got it horribly wrong and we, we actually ended up deciding, and this is because in many cases we use real tapestries from the period where they were available or, or something that was very, very akin, um, to let them look faded because, unfortunately, if we'd put them in the garish colours that they used at the time, people w- would have been appalled. For example, if you go to um, uh, Hampton Court and look at the, the tapestries in the Great Hall, which are said to be, after the crown jewels, the most valuable things we have in the kingdom... They look very beautifully sort of faded and rather sort of thoughtful and considered. You just look at the back 
if Lucy Worsley's there with you, she'll allow you to do it. They're really garish, <laughs> bright colours. Now, uh, you know, we can't do that now because it would just look wrong. Uh, Claire Van Camp and audiences tend to think that Elizabethan music is a bit garish, if, we, if one can apply the term. They find, I mean, you know, the sound of authentic Elizabethan instruments is rather raucous. Uh, it's rather shrill to our contemporary I think ears. if you come to the Globe, you'll change your opinion. <laughs> I well, hope I like you it, will. But, but I, audiences I have been known to. Have they? <laughs> I take your word for it. Audiences seem to love the music at the Globe. And um, I think, joking apart, one of the reasons that early music has had a, a rather bad press um, during the last 30 years is that people didn't, uh, early on, know how to play those instruments very well. And also they were picking music that was inappropriate, unsuitable for them. You know, you have to think of them like very special people. You know, they're hothouse flowers. They need careful tending and you have to write for them in a certain way. They don't play all the notes that modern instruments do. What notes do they play? Those notes are often very much more beautiful than I modern instruments can I was intrigued by reading achieve. something that suggests these instruments work better in the open space of the globe than modern instruments, that they have a quality that... Well, I think they do. Certainly natural trumpets, um, the harmonic series of a natural trumpet, I think corresponds to the geography and the architecture of the building, which is all based on divine proportion, uh, which is a classical rule of architecture. And the instruments are built in the same way. So they kind of have a symbiotic relationship, which I think people pick up on when they come into the building because it's based on the proportions of the human body. And it's not just the fact that they, they do also cut through the air a little bit more effectively. They definitely <laughs> cut through the air. You need them to cut through the air when you've got, you know, 1,800 people and aeroplanes and riverboats. Uh, I'm, I have to ask you one question of authenticity that has been nagging at me. You've written a play um, uh, about uh, Farinelli, called Farinelli and the King. Farinelli, famous um, castrato. Mm. How far are you going to go in authenticity and delivering <laughs> Farinelli? <laughs> To a contemporary audience. Well, it's a question that actually both countertenors who are singing the arias, um, uh, they, they, they were rather perturbed, actually, when I asked them. And uh, they said, you do realise I'm not a castrato? And I said, yes, I do realise that. I'm not going to ask you to go that extra mile. Um, no, we, we will never know what the sound of a castrato uh, at the age of 32 was like. We don't have any recordings of one from that age. Um, we have a recording of what's called the last castrato, uh, who was fairly elderly when he made the recording, and so we can't judge what that voice was like. But we can have an idea of the effect it had, certainly on the, the very depressed and mentally ill King Philip V of Spain. It had an enormous and radical effect on his illness. Yes, it's a rather uh, unusual, very early example of music therapy, this, it, this it incident, is. isn't it? And that's... Uh, partly what fascinated me uh, in, in terms of sort of thinking about the play because the film Farinelli doesn't go into that area of Farinelli's relationship with this king and how they became terribly necessary to each other uh, and in fact Farinelli didn't, didn't leave him uh, he stayed with the king until the king died many years later yeah, extraordinary, because he was in mm. hugely in demand all over Europe. Um, Antonia, I wanted to ask you, you you say in your book that you listen to music, you listen to contemporary uh, music of the time you're writing about. Why do you find that helpful? Oh, I, to me it's part of um, immersing myself in the period. I mean, when I was writing about the gunpowder plot, listening to William Byrd, um, who I always have liked. I'm a Catholic, you know, and I like his masses, for example. Um, but it wasn't until I studied the subject that I discovered the reason there are masses for three and four voices is because if you're doing mass illegally in a criminal offence with very, very nasty consequences, which um, the Tudors would have understood for the priests, then you can't have a huge choir. You have three or four voices. So to write about it and listen to that at the same time was very exciting. I mean, with Marie Antoinette, I listened to Gluck, who she favoured, um, uh, uh, um, to me, it's part of and looking at the pictures and what I call optical research, going to the places. Um, I do notice, when I go to places and look at them, I do notice historians of a past era who have not been um, and, and, and make mistakes, you know, um, because there is no substitute from actually going there, even if, 
if the, the battlefield looks completely different. You always see something, you get a feel. I, I think optical research is a, f- a fantastic experience. Optical and acoustical research. Yes, mm-hmm. um, yes, Peter exactly. Kozminski used a lot of, of contemporary music. In fact, Claire, you provide the, many of the dances, I think. I'm right The historical saying. music. The historical yes. music for Wolf Hall. Um, to what degree is that bringing in uh, real historical knowledge? I mean, obviously, when you've got uh, a court dancing a galliard, there's a set of, of relationships in play there that is completely unlike anything well, that we know now. I was incredibly lucky, first of all, that, that Claire Van Kammer was prepared to help us out um, to make sure that the music was not only the right music but played in an authentic way and also the wonderful choreographer Sean Williams who also works mm-hmm. from time to time at the, at the Globe uh, to, to choreograph our dances for us. You know, one of the joys of being allowed to do something like Wolf Hall, where where the budget was tight but not ridiculously tight, was that we were able to do it properly. We were able to go to the, the, the people who knew about these things and collaborate with them to get the best result. I think it makes all the difference, actually, because when you hear the music and you see the way people moved in dance together, then you have the world. It's very simple, but there it is. Just as you were saying about contemporary music today gives us our world. Um, how do you how do you discover the historical dance moves? I mean, the the music is sometimes notated. Do you but know? It... Uh, well, the music of, it isn't always notated. I've done uh, all the arrangements actually from um, existent tunes or manuscripts. And the and dance, just quickly, because we're running out. The of time. dance. <laughs> it, Sean Williams is a historical specialist on dance and uh, knows all about it: galliards to syncopaces to what you will. You have left an enigma in the air. I still want to know how they know which which way which leg went and which way the arm went. But um, that's there are for some charts. There are, <laughs> there are okay. charts. Yeah. That's for another time. Anyway, thank you to all of my guests. Uh, Antonia Fraser's My History is out now. As is Dan Jones's The Hollow Crown, The Wars of the Roses. Peter Kosminski's series Wolf Hall begins on the twenty first of January, and Claire Van Campen's play Farinelli and the King opens next month at the Sam Wanamaker Theatre. Next week. Surveillance and Self-Censorship with James Graham, Paul Muldoon and Corey Doctorow. For now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free. Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. There are few stories quite as gripping as historical stories. The drama of how we got here is a gripping storyline, a betrayal of historical realities, though, or the only way we can understand history. With us today, four expert historical storytellers to talk about how you shape the past to make sense to the present. Dan Jones has written books about the Peasants' Revolt and the early Plantagenets, and he's now taken the story on with an account of the Wars of the Roses. The biographer and historian Lady Antonia Fraser has turned from the history of other men and women to her own in My History, a memoir of growing up. Composer and playwright Claire Van Campen ensures the historical authenticity of productions at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London. And the director, Peter Kosminski, is also with us. His television adaptation of Hilary Mantel's novels about the Tudor court of Henry VIII starts on BBC Two next week. We begin, though, with what Hollywood would probably call the prequel, the bloody and turbulent period that gave rise to the Tudors, explored in Dan Jones's new book, the Holly King, isn't it? That's really what your book is about, the the creation of this well, that, idea. That's right. I mean, during the way I look at the wars of the, the, wars of the 15th century um, were not as wars of the roses because, for one reason, um, whilst the House of York uh, was represented by a white rose, the House of Lancaster really wasn't, and this was, this was a, a sort of late projection backwards by the Tudors onto the House of Lancaster, mainly, as far as I can see, to create the Tudor Rose, to to come up with a very simple analogy or a very simple image for what had just happened. These chaotic, bloody, complicated, shifting wars of the 15th century could be explained in purely dynastic terms, reds versus whites, it was like a football match, not a Tudor football match, I hasten to add, a modern football match, uh, in which they all came together at the end. And 
uh, the most, and that's why it stayed. In, in, yeah, in, and if that was that's the, how we think of it now. If that was the symbolic solution, then they had to yes. reverse engineer it to to insist that that had been the problem in the first place. But in your view, it wasn't. It was a, it was a different kind of it, thing that was happening. It was very very different. Uh, but the, I think the reason why it's uh, it's lasted this image of of the Wars of the Roses as such history with uh, the issues of the Reformation, because of course the Poles were. A, a, a leading Catholic family. So it's the sort of last bit of clearing up, the last bit of, of murderous clearing up to ensure that the reign continues without without the problems they've had in the past. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, I just wanted to get this sense that um, people were still thinking in terms of the Wars of the Roses. People were still trying to digest uh, the issues of the 15th century really deep in, in the 16th century. And, and towards the end of the book, I described the coronation procession of Elizabeth I. Now, when she came out of the Tower of London, processing towards Westminster, went through the city, as was uh, Tudor Convention, there were, there were pageants to sort of celebrate this great day. The first pageant she saw uh, displayed Henry VII and Elizabeth of York getting married, and it, and it was the white rose and the red, and it was this image of the Wars of the Roses, the peculiarly Tudor image of the Wars of the Roses, that was the the starting point of Tudor history, you know, in, in the second half of the 16th century. Um, I hadn't known until I read your book that the Wars of the Roses, that phrase, was essentially a Victorian invention. But it's built on this this Tudor myth making Which is kind of a binary, um, reds versus white. It, a lot of it is to do with Shakespeare. Because Shakespeare's sort of genius, his dramatic genius, um, applied to the politics of the 15th century in the 1590s, uh, was so great and so influential and has been so powerful over the centuries, that's still how we think of the Wars of the Roses today. We can't get past this lens of Shakespeare when we're looking back into the 15th century. But as I try and explain in the book, the, the reality was, was a lot messier than that. Uh, it's it's both messier and um, uh, and less uh, reprehensible in many ways, isn't it? I mean, you're quite generous to many of the principals who other historians haven't been generous to, saying that we're just trying to make the best of a bad job. They had Henry VI, a very weak king who'd followed a very strong king, a paragon of kingship, and they somehow had to make that work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things you, I think you've got to remember when you're writing history, um, and I think this is something that H Hilary... Mantel might have told Peter is that these people don't know they're in history so when you're analysing decision making in history you have to remember Low crown. Um, Dan Jones you, you begin in almost classic miniseries style right at the end with this grisly event uh, the execution of Margaret Pole very very late in the story you're telling why did you want to begin there? Well, I think one of the things I wanted to show when I was writing about the Wars of the Roses um, or, was that it didn't happen in isolation, if you see what I mean. There's, there wasn't a point in 1485 when everyone suddenly went, OK, the Wars of the Roses have finished now because the Battle of Bosworth happened and now it's Tudor time. Uh, really, the issues um, that developed during the Wars of the Roses carried on, all, and they petered out, but they carried on deep into the Tudor period beyond the reign of Henry VII, where we normally think, you know, um, uh, Battle of Stoke, uh, pretenders to the throne, but right into the reign of Henry VIII. And the episode you're describing, the execution of Margaret Pole in the Tower of London when she was 67 years old, people thought she was 80 or 90, um, happened in the 1540s. And this isn't a time when we normally think the politics of the Wars of the Roses uh, have anything to do with the politics of the Tudor state. The episode draws together... Uh, the sort of uh, lingering remains of Plantagenet